Amen. Good morning, church family. It's great to be in the house of the Lord. I uh, want to take a quick moment. Um, so Kim was just letting me know. Uh, as we have talked about before, today was the day that we had asked that everyone bring their shoe boxes in. Um, he was letting me know that there's still a little bit of time. If you have yours and you didn't bring it in yet, um, get in touch with him. And then you have a couple of extra days of, of grace time there if you need it. Um, But we are going to certainly pray over these at the end of the service, and uh, we're just expecting great things from what God is going to do through these shoeboxes. It's a fantastic ministry, uh, and it's always exciting to sort of see the church kind of come together and and the promise of of where these shoeboxes go and what they do in the lives of these young people. Uh, Again, it's great to see everyone here today. I want to let everyone know um, this is, of course, our 10 o'clock crowd, but if for some reason you happen to miss the 10 o'clock service, the... Previously, 11.30 service has been moved to 11.15. Uh, we found that with many hands makes light work, right? And, and so the, the process of transitioning from one to the other went much smoother than we expected. And so we uh, t- sort of took a little poll there in the room and we decided that we'll start at 11.15. So if you wanted to be part of that, and for those at home, if you want to join us in the 11.15 service, you're more than welcome to. Um, so it's no longer 11.30, it is now 11.15. So with that said... Uh, let's continue our worship today. Let's uh, open in a word of prayer. Ask God to bless our time here. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day you have given us. Lord, we thank you for the rains. Um, it's, it's a reminder of the, the promise of new life and growth and uh, just this beautiful world that you have created for us. And Lord, as we gather here uh, to give you glory, Lord, I pray that you are glorified in everything that is said and done. Uh, Lord, we have come to worship at your feet. And so, Uh, Lord, I pray that you would prepare our hearts, uh, Lord, to just give you glory. That was the reason we were created. That is the reason we have assembled. And so, Lord, uh, let us not leave here today without having given you glory. And, Lord, we we ask a blessing uh, over this community, over this church body, over this state. Uh, Lord, we know that uh, the the effects of COVID-19 are still out there. Uh, Lord, this is still a very real thing for us, and so we pray uh, your hand of protection over this church. We pray your hand of protection over uh, this nation and, and this world, really. This is, uh, this is not isolated in any one place. Lord, we are all going through this together. So we pray, Lord, that you are still leading us. Give us wisdom. Give us patience. Uh, Lord, help us to be uh, wise during these difficult times. But Lord, again, we, we ask that you be sovereign here at this time, that you be uh, glorified here at this time. And Lord, we ask all of these things, uh, praying in the way that you have taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning. It's time to sing a song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me. Let me be singing when the evening comes. Oh, 
And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. team. We'll go ahead and get out your Bibles. We're going to certainly need those today. Uh, we're going to continue through Acts chapter 14. We're going to fin- uh, finish up chapter 14 today. And the remaining passages in this chapter, um, there's a lot of narrative in there, if, if you will. Uh, but there are a few pieces that, that sort of jump out and have a real message for us. If you recall last time, Paul had sort of circled back and arrived back in Pisidian Antioch. And we were going to be returning all the way back to Syrian Antioch at this point. So if you recall, there were the two different Antiochs. Um, he is going to come full circle all the way uh, in his return trip. And in this, we're going to talk about our purpose in our mission. And so my hope today is that as we look at this and we see the completion of Paul's first missionary journey here, uh, that we are mindful of what have we been sent to do? What exactly is it that we have been called to complete and to do so well? Would you join me uh, beginning in verse 24, Acts chapter 14? Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. When they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. And from there, they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them, and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And there remained no little time with the disciples. Would you join me as we ask the Lord to bless the reading, the teaching, the hearing, and the application of his word. Heavenly Father, as always, we begin by giving you thanks for your word. Uh, Lord, your, uh, these scriptures are our instructions for life. Lord, they teach us everything we need to know about this life, everything we need to know about you. Um, but Lord, even they are not uh, a full, comprehensive understanding of who you are. Lord, you are far greater than words can contain. And Lord, we Uh, We stand in awe of who you are, but we are grateful for just this glimpse that you give us here in your scripture. Lord, we pray that as we value every word and savor every word of your text, uh, Lord, that you would leap forth from the page that your Holy Spirit would uh, give us new insight, that he would be our interpreter here at this time, and Lord, that we would uh, grow in our understanding and our love for you. Lord, we pray that you would be sovereign here in this time. Be honored and glorified by all that is said and done. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So as I mentioned earlier, there's a fair bit of narration here. right? It's, it's kind of a, a little travel log for a little while. Uh, they're moving back through, uh, again, to, to uh, Pisidia, Pamphylia. Uh, when they had spoken the word in Perga, it stands to reason there was another church built or established there in Perga. Then they went down to uh, Italia. And from there, they sailed to Antioch. So here's where it gets interesting. There's an expression right after this. Where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. This particular text here is what jumps out at me. 
You see, they've completed their full loop, but here they were commended to the grace of God. If you remember, Syrian Antioch was the place in which they were first commissioned. They were sort of uh, sent out by the church in Antioch. It was both Paul and Barnabas. They were sent out. But this word commended, a lot of times we hear a, a commendation as some sort of a you know, reward or recognition or something of that sort. Uh, but here, commended means to be presented as suitable. They were presented as suitable to the grace of God. Or if you take the word and kind of flip it a little bit, they were suitable to present the grace of God. That begs the question, what makes one suitable? If we are to be presented as suitable to the grace of God, this is certainly something that should be desirable to all people. So what makes one suitable? Well, a lot of times in modern context, when we think about what it means to be suitable, we think in some level of expertise or, uh, or, or knowledge or education. And so when we look at matters of, say, education, now we know Paul was a very well-educated man, but over and over and over through his epistles, we see that his education really amounted to just about nothing. He stood on it very little. He used it from time to time as an opportunity to kind of strike up a conversation, but when it came to the matters that, uh, that mattered the most, the matters of faith, he simply discarded most of, of the things that he had learned. So education really wasn't any bearing in his ministry. And Barnabas, we don't know a lot about the education of Barnabas. Uh, Barnabas was, of course, known as a great man of encouragement, but we do not know whether or not he had this certain expertise. God, of course, had used him in a great way, and so what he had was experience. What they both had was experience, a personal experience with God. That's encouraging, and I hope that encourages you, because a personal experience with God is something that we all share. We who trust in Christ as our Lord and Savior all share in that personal life-changing experience with Christ. Which brings me to what I hope is not a revelation, but perhaps it is. You are suitable to present the grace of God. In that shared experience that we have, you too are suitable to present the grace of God. We have all been commended to the grace of God. Though of course, the great commission that has been made available to all. We have all been presented as suitable, to use uh, the language of that definition there. So if you have received the grace of God, you present it constantly. Think about that. As image bearers of Christ, as recipients of the Holy Spirit, everywhere we go, we are putting Christ on display, whether we choose to or not. The question is really, what are we showing? And so we have to ask ourselves the question, if we are suitable to present Christ, the grace of God, if we, by virtue of the Great Commission, in the same sort of way have been commended and sent out into this world, we have to ask ourselves, what image are we sending out? Are we letting the light of Christ shine in our life? And I'm reminded of Matthew 5. This is verses 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This stern reminder that we have of the impact that we should have, the demonstration of the, God, of, of the Lord's grace in our life. And so we see here two things. We see salt and light. We have to ask ourselves, why these? What do these represent? What does this mean for us? Well, we look at salt. What does salt do? 
It makes one want. It makes us thirsty. It makes people thirst. Do we live a life that causes people to thirst for the Lord? Now, salt has another effect. It's actually a couple of effects, but we're not going to go into all of them. It has the ability to sort of enhance the flavor of what you are salting. And we have to ask ourselves, are our lives enhanced by the work of the Holy Spirit? Do we experience a joy that is greater than the joy that this world can provide? Do we experience peace that is greater than what this world can provide? And I'll even go as far as to say, do we experience grief and sorrow more than this world can provide? Because you see, our grief and our sorrow are often tied to eternal ramifications. We grieve, we mourn for a world that will spend an eternity apart from Christ. Whereas those in this world may grieve for a temporary loss that ends with death. We know that there is more to it. Do we amplify our life in light of Christ? And do we live a life that causes others to want what we have? Do we leave them wanting to know more? To say, what is it about your life that's different? What do you have that I don't. Tell me about this. Do we leave them wanting? Is our spiritual life salty, if you will? Also gives us the illustration of light. Light, of course, illuminates. It says that very clearly in our passage. Do we let the light of Christ shine? We've become a very private society where we keep things to ourselves. Sometimes that's for the best. But do we allow that to control the light of Christ in our life? Are we letting his light shine? Or if we take the context of the passage here and look at what it says here, are we hiding it? Are we hiding our faith as if under a basket, depriving the household of its benefit? Look at that again. It says, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. You see, there are others that benefit when we let the light of Christ shine in our lives. All in the house benefit from it. So while we may feel that we're just sort of being a private person and we, we don't like to let things out, we don't want to interact all that much, we don't want to share too much, whatever it may be, we're not simply depriving ourselves. We are depriving others. We are depriving all in the house of the benefits, the illumination of the light of Christ. And then lastly, we see that the purpose of this light is to illuminate your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, I want to key in on the reason for that. It says to illuminate your good works. Now, we know that when we sort of brag about things, if we put our good works on display here in this life for personal glory or gain, then we have earned our reward here on this earth, and we have lost the reward that was due us in heaven. And so when we look at this passage, we understand that this is in no way, shape, or form talking about drawing attention to ourselves for the good works that we have done. It's about drawing attention to Christ for the good works that he has done. And we come back to our passage here in Acts, and we see that as we continue on, they gathered the church together, and they declared all that God had done with them. Now let me back up a little bit there. They gathered the church together. This means that we should be doing this with other believers. We should be sharing what God is doing in our lives. We should be sharing the good work that God is doing among other believers because it gives encouragement. It gives hope. We need to be building one another up as a body. And my hope is that perhaps in January or as soon as we possibly can, my hope is that the Wednesday night prayer services that we've been doing online throughout this year, I would like to see them happen in person. 
at some point in time. And this is an opportunity that we would have to share the good works that God is doing in our life, to share them together, to lift one another up, to bring hope and encouragement to one another, because there are times in which it feels like God is perhaps silent in our lives. And it's encouraging to see him move in someone else's, because it reminds us that perhaps we're just in a period of waiting, that God isn't gone, we're just simply waiting. So we need to be encouraging one another. We need to be declaring all that God has done with us. So they declare it. Using that same passage of putting the emphasis on the second part. Again, we don't take too much credit in what good works have been done through us because they were declaring what God had done with them. Right? God had done Not they had done. God had done with them. Because you see, it is his glory to claim, not ours. We do not take credit for anything that God has done. It is God that is playing the music. We are merely blessed to be the instrument on occasion. But this is God's work. And so what did God do? Well, our text tells us that he opened a door of faith. Now, I want you to pay attention to something that happens in this passage. We've talked uh, a couple times now about sort of the, the five solas and how they fit together. And I've often sort of made that illustration of, you know, salvation being sort of handed over uh, in grace or extended in grace and received in faith. It's the, the critical juncture between grace and faith. And if we go back to our text, what we see here is they were commended to the grace of God. This is verse 26. Paul and Barnabas were commended to the grace of God. They were sent out. They were extended in grace. What did God do with them? He opened a door of faith. The circle is completed. Salvation extended in grace, received in faith. Because we see this door It's merely opened. They still have to cross through it. This is something that has to be done to complete it. The door has to be used to serve its purpose, but it makes a way. Salvation extended through grace, received in faith. Again, this is important for us to remember those who have been sent out in grace, that we merely open the door. We can't push people through it. And so we see here in our text that it was God who did the work, but they were faithful to be used in the process. Our text tells us that they fulfilled the work. It's important that we finish the job that we set out to begin. We talked last week about kind of circling back and re-spinning the plates as they go. Sometimes we do a poor job when it comes to discipleship. We make converts, we don't make disciples. We've been called to complete, to complete the work, to finish the job that we have been set to do. And so we have to be diligent to see it all the way through. Can I just tell you that that's a difficult thing sometimes? It's easy to sort of do the job from A to Y. I don't know if anybody else struggles with that, but sometimes that Z is a little difficult. I heard an expression many years ago that said if you move into the house before the The floorboards are painted. It'll never happen. And so, in the same sort of way, we need to make sure that we're not cutting any corners with what God has sent us out to do. That we are being faithful to fulfill what God is doing with us. That we are blessed to be a part of. And so my encouragement to you today is to remember that you too have been commended. As we look at this, as we sort of bring chapter 14 to a close, as we look at the completion of the work that Paul and Barnabas have done, we of course celebrate with the church here in Syria and Antioch for the good work that was completed, for the door of faith being opened to the Gentiles. But in the same way, I hope that this gives you hope to know that you are just as equipped for this same purpose and this same calling as they were. And that where God has used them in a mighty way because they were obedient to be used by God. 
that he can do the same for you. When we step forth and allow ourselves to let the light of Christ shine in our lives, to be this salt, to be this light in the world around us, to be faithful to what we have been commended to, the grace of God. And then I want to encourage you that as you do this, as you see Christ at work in the world around you, as you see the change, declare it. See, that's that fulfillment that I think we fall short on. I think perhaps we do a good job of being faithful, living out the Christian life. We do a good job perhaps being faithful and letting the light of Christ shine. But what we do not do as often as perhaps we should is gather together the believers and declare the good works of God that he has done with us. And so I want to encourage you to declare the good works of God because it's his glory to receive, not ours. Let us not contain his glory. Let us not deprive him of his glory. God is continually doing good works. Even in when it seems like the the news channels are throughout the whole year just surrounded with bad news. We're, We're a society that's interested in bad news, right? If you look at the ratings, that's what sells. We love hearing bad news. We don't really love it, I guess, but it's just, it keeps us interested. How about we don't take that philosophy into the church? How about we share the good things that God is doing? How about we declare the good works of the Lord to one another, building us up, giving hope, giving encouragement, and reminding one another, reminding this world that God is still at work. So in that same theme of sending things forth and expecting great things, And declaring what God has done, I want to conclude with a blessing over these shoeboxes. We've talked about these before, and many of you are familiar with this ministry. For those who do not know, these shoeboxes go all around the world, and they go into the hands of children. Inside are many supplies that they would need for life. But also inside is a message of hope, a message of the gospel. That changes everything. You see, a, a tube of toothpaste or you know, a washcloth or all of these little things, they may change things for a time. But it is Christ that changes for an eternity. And so, as we send these out, we want to pray that God is going before them, that he is preparing the hearts and minds of these young people to receive this message that, again, if we go back to our text, is being extended in grace to be received in faith. That is what we were praying here today, that they would receive this message of hope by faith. We know there are many hurdles between here and there. These boxes go through many different places. So we pray that perhaps as they pass through the many hands that it takes to finally arrive at that one child, that perhaps that message of hope would receive one of those hands as well. We don't know the half of what God can do. And so we just lift him up. Now we've had some stories of of life change and what I'd like to do next week is I'd like to just continue the theme of this passage and I'd like to spend some time declaring the works of the Lord with you. I'd like to share some updates from some of our missionaries and perhaps we can share some news of Obviously not these boxes, they would not have arrived by then, but boxes that have gone out in the past. So you can see the good works that the Lord has done through people like yourselves. And we can have hope as to what is going to happen. So if you would, join me as we pray over these boxes. Again, asking the Lord to lead them, that they would be fruitful, and that he would receive glory through what is being done. Would you join me? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we lift up these shoeboxes. Lord, they're just shoeboxes in a physical sense, but Lord, we know they represent so much more. They represent hope. They are an expression of the love that only you can give us. And so, Lord, I pray that as these are sent forth, Lord, that you would bless them, that you would bless their entire journey, 
Lord, that they would arrive precisely where you intend them to. Into whomever's hands that you have determined needs them. Or that you desire to receive them. Lord, we pray that you are working on the hearts and the minds of those that will receive them. Uh, Lord, we trust that you are going before them. And just preparing that soil to receive in faith this message of hope. The message of salvation extended by your loving grace. Lord, we don't deserve it, but you extend it in grace. And Lord, we know that these boxes go through many hands. And for many of these people, this is just simply a job. But Lord, I hope that perhaps just one of them would wonder, what is this all about? What does this project mean? What does this stand for? That, Lord, they would look into it. They would do their research. And, uh, Lord, there may be someone in the middle whose life is forever changed. They never even receive the box, Lord. They just simply a part of the process, but we, we have seen time and time again how your saving grace can reach all involved. And so, uh, Lord, we pray that a work like that would be done and we uh, look expectantly towards the, the stories that will come from these. And we know, Lord, it may, may take months, it may even take years. Uh, Lord, as we reflect on our lives, we know that there are times in which we received your message of salvation, but Lord, uh, it it was academic. It was in our minds. It wasn't simply uh, a way that we lived our life. It wasn't something we fully received. It may have been something we acknowledged or understood, but we didn't fully receive it for some time after. And we know that the same may be true with these young people, that they may need to hear this message today. The seed will be planted today, but Lord, it may not fully grow and develop for time to come. And so, Lord, we pray a blessing over the lives of these young people, that you would grow their faith, that you would send missionaries, you would send people to them that would water their faith. Lord, we know that it is you that causes the growth, but you use us in the process. So, Lord, we ask that you would be uh, faithful to see it all the way through, that you would complete the good work that you started, that you have allowed us to be a part of. And, Lord, that you would receive all glory, honor, and praise through it. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Well, man, again, I'll be dismissing you from uh, the back here in just one moment. But to our church family, both near and afar, as always, we love you. And the Lord bless you and keep you. And I'll see you all next week. God bless.